Hi, and welcome everyone to Novartis Researchers Day. My name is Teja, coming for, from Strategic Programs team in Novartis in Slovenia, and I will be your guide through this event. Novartis Researcher Days is the part of Uniminds Festival. In, it is the largest online festival for building innovation communities and long-term partnership between academia and the business. For the fourth time in a row, we will be celebrating science and share examples of joint efforts and successes. The event is an important platform to develop and exchange our expertise and inspire new collaborations. The next two, two hours are divided into the three sections. In the first part, we will hear more about the results and best practice from research voucher projects Novartis in Slovenia with all three national universities. Just to let you know, after every presentation, we will have a few minutes for your questions. Here we encourage you to write your question in the chat and our speakers will answer them. We will start with University of Ljubljana, Faculty of Pharmacy. Professor Rog Drew, PhD, Assistant Professor Zoran Lauric, PhD, and Mateja Stogoj Novak, PhD, the word is yours. Thank you, Charlotte, for the kind introduction. Let me just share my screen. I will give control to. Okay, so dear participants of uh, the UniMinds 2020, in the following minutes, we will present development of alternative preformulation and headline techniques with aim of supporting product development as well as product production. Uh, we will focus on formulation and process of hot melt extrusion, which is suitable for formation of single phase solid dispersions of drug in a polymer matrix with or without the aid of plasticizer. Formation of drug solid dispersions in a polymer matrix is an important approach to solubilize and improve the solution rate of poorly soluble drugs that would otherwise lead to poor or insufficient drug bioavailability. Hot melt extrusion is a suitable technique that by means of shearing material via two or more screws introduces enough mechanical energy to soften polymer matrix and facilitate the formation of drug solid dispersion. Solid dispersions in the form of cylindrical extrudates are then usually milled and filled into capsules or pressed into tablets. In order to support the hot melt formulation development and to assure headline tool to check product quality during continuous production of product extrudates, we are exploring the option of near spectroscopy as alternative to a Raman chemical mapping technique, which is much more time consuming technique that is with the aim of assessing longitudinal homogeneity of extrudates. Extrudates can be inhomogeneous in structure due to poor miscibility of components or due to poor in-process mixing or variation of material fitting. Additionally, we will explore whether mechanical evaluation of extrudates can predict behavior during extrudate milling and hence predict the broad particle size distributions or, or even complete failure of milling process. Within the experimental design, we are varying composition of extrudates comprising uh, model drug and different polymers with or without the addition of plasticizer and varying hot melt extrusion process parameters such as material uh, feed rate, screw rotation frequency, and screw configuration. Extrudates are prepared using Leistritz 12 millimeter twin screw extruder equipped with 1.8 millimeter extrusion die. Extra dates are then evaluated by near spectroscopy, by reference Raman chemical mapping, and assessed for their mechanical properties using three point bending test, nano and macro indentation techniques, as well as by dynamic mechanical analysis. Extra date samples will be milled using standardized method utilizing lab scale camera mill, and milled product will be assessed in terms of particle size distribution using laser diffraction technique and in terms of particle shape using microscopy and image analysis. Zoran, please continue. Thank you for the uh, previous uh, uh, pre uh, presentation. In the ongoing proof of concept study, uh, we have retained the formulation composition with the model drug, Colidon VA64 polymer and Glidant Aerosil 200, and have varied the hot melt extrusion process in terms of two screw configuration and material dosing speed on two levels, 150 and 450 grams per hour. 
The first screw configuration using experiment five and six had more kneading elements and a distributive mixing zone, while screw configuration used in experiments seven and eight comprised more transport elements with only one kneading zone. Temperature profile was more or less retained the same. We can observe that resonance time distribution going from first to second screw configuration and then using higher feeding rates. Could you, um, I, uh, could you, um, Next slide. yeah, I, I do not have control of, yes. Uh, slide six, uh, uh, extracts were, were sampled during extrusion time by retaining first, middle, and last meter and were then divided into 10 centimeter segments. Individual 10 centimeter segments were evaluated by using special holder with mirror in mixed diffuse reflectance and transflectance mode. On each 10 centimeter segments, six equidistant points were used to capture NIR spectrum. Longitudinal extruded homogeneity was assessed based on difference between pre-processed NRR spectra. Intergroup homogeneity was evaluated by comparing groups of 60 spectra obtained for individual beginning, middle, and, enter, and end meter of extruded. For this purpose, batch maturity analysis method of SOLO plus MIA by eigenvector research was employed. Two-factor PCA analysis was used and both score plots show that from all compared spectra, the first meter of experiment seven extrudate deviates from other groups of individual experiment samples. samples. The same is true for the second factor where, and both PCI factors describe 99.88 variability of NIR spectrum. On, we also assess total variability between samples of experiments five, six, seven, and eight. Or very, which were comprised of 180 spectra, representing combined meters from different process time points. Batch analysis method was employed where one component BCI described 99.885% variability of NIR spectra. Again, it was shown both by the score plot as well as in the Q residual plot that spectra of experiment seven deviate the most from others. Q residuals versus Hotelling T squared plot, however, indicates that variation of experiment seven spectra is not the, con the consequence of individual outliers. And in the ongoing study, we have prepared also three subsequent three by 100 point Raman maps and evaluated first three centimeters of the first 10 centimeter extrudate for experiments five, six, seven, and eight. Homogeneity of samples was evaluated by histograms of representative signal strength ratios for modal drug and polymer. Ideally, distribution of two characteristic signal ratios for drug and polymer should be univariate. Distribution width and shape represents a relative measure of homogeneity between samples. Com comparison of distribution widths between experiments have show, has shown that sample from experiment seven has broader distribution width than other samples, which confirms NIR method prediction that experiment sample is of lesser homogeneity than other samples within first meter. This suggests the potential of NIR method to rather quickly screen long longitudinal homogeneity of extrudates, which can be useful in the formulation and process development. Thank so you. And already discussed, a group of tests assessing extrudates mechanical properties as predictor for the milling process will be carried out on extruded samples. So the sample should exhibit sufficient brittleness in order to successfully undergo the milling process. The advantage of simple three-point bending test and indentation test is that no special prior sample preparation is required in order to perform the analysis. So sample preparation by shape remodel, remodeling can possibly change sample structures, so, such as in case of dynamic mechanical analysis approach. In indentation test has already been successfully employed to predict the processability of extrudates in the fused deposition modeling 3D printing process. Hot melt extrusion extrudates can also represent drug-loaded filaments that can be used to 3D print dosage forms 
in order to facilitate approach of the personalized medicine or to achieve complex drug dissolution profiles in order to alleviate the burden of chronic pharmacotherapy. So based on 23 different formulations, we have successfully established a model that predicts whether certain filament composition has adequate properties to successfully enable printing process and the process does not fail due to inadequate filament properties. Prediction model is simple and bases only on one pre-formulation parameter. Uh, this is uh, indentation force and uh, 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 relative standard deviation. This result demonstrates that the suitability of including mechanical property tests in the pre-formulation toolbox that can be used, of course, for the pro uh, product development and process development. So the presented study is actually a collaboration of groups from faculty of pharmacy and faculty of mechanical engineering from University of Ljubljana and researchers from Lake Research and Development Center. Thank you for your attention. Uh, and are there any questions to describe? Rook and Zoran, thank you. So do we have any question? Uh, let us check in the chat. Okay, uh, we have one question. Um, as both near and Raman spectro spectroscopy techniques can be used as inline techniques, as, as most suitable model for monitoring continuous process as near approach still adventures to Raman approach to be present to application. Yes, it, it is true uh, that both techniques can be uh, also used in inline mode. We have used them both in at line mode. Uh, but near instruments are still cheaper investment in comparison with Raman uh, instruments in order to be omnipresent, both at research and production uh, sites. Furthermore, uh, near signal is stronger, much stronger than a Raman signal, which uh, represents then shorter, which uh, actually enables shorter signal integration times. Uh, and this could possibly still lead to meaningful uh, spatial resolution during extra date movements. So shorter. Uh, time for recording the signal is here much beneficial. Additionally, Raman signal can also exhibit unwanted fluorescence of the uh, in the signal if shorter laser length uh, wavelengths are used. So if we are going to longer uh, wavelengths, then we have to increase the, the, the recording time uh, at one point, and that means that we are not uh, be a, we are not able to resolve the the information in very short period of time, which is needed when the sample is move, moving, actually. OK, thank you. Uh, so no other questions in who below for now. And thank let's uh, move on. Uh, once again, thank you, Rook and Zoran. Uh, next, we will get to know best practice from University of Maribor, Faculty of Me Mechanical Engineering. Firstly, Professor Istok Palcic, PhD, will present his project, and then Professor Bojan Dolšak, PhD, will tell us more about his collaboration. In both cases, Niko Rosman Z uh, Zorko from Novartis in Slovenia was co author. Okay, thank you very much for this introduction. Uh, greetings from Maribor. Uh, we will present two projects. Uh, the first one uh, is uh, is dealing with. Uh, just a second. Yes, is dealing with uh, the Lendava site of the Lek company, and uh, this uh, site is uh, can be regarded also as a packaging center for uh, the different uh, products that they are making here uh, uh, in uh, not making but the packaging here in Slovenia uh, so their uh, plant in Lendava has uh, four packaging units and these packaging units have uh, several uh, packaging lines so from five six or seven uh, lines at uh, each packaging uh, unit with uh, these packaging uh, units uh, therefore include uh, sophisticated and advanced uh, packaging clients and uh, these packaging clients uh, have two parts primary part that mostly deals with uh, inserting for example tablets into the uh, foils and blisters and the secondary part that is dealing with uh, uh, inserting instructions in the box that uh, and we, we are all familiar how these uh, boxes with 
medicals so with tablets look like but what is the point of our project the point of our project is that uh, this uh, number of uh, packaging units and the uh, packaging clients uh, requires uh, very good organization in terms of scheduling the orders that are coming into the uh, packaging center all the time and each of these uh, packaging clients has three types of employees that are uh, working on these lines. These are operators that are, as the name says, operating this packaging line. Then there is a technician with specific, uh, specific let's say, uh, management uh, activities as well, being also uh, in charge, in control of what's going on. And there is also a very, really important role of mechanics. And these are people who are responsible for setting up these packaging clients when the new batch of, uh, of product uh, is uh, arriving to a specific packaging client. And this uh, setting up needs time and needs specific knowledge from these people. Uh, and uh, as we identified, this is the main cause for uh, problems in scheduling of uh, you know, these packaging clients. So our challenge is, uh, re, uh, is connected with the following facts. The number of working orders and their scope really varies. So the packaging center has many, many hundreds, thousands of different situations where they have to uh, pack their products in different batch sizes, uh, of course, different, uh, there are different shapes of their medicals, there are different shapes of boxes, and uh, so the variability is really, really huge, and of course, also the, uh, the size of each order can uh, be different. So working orders vary in their complexity as well. Uh, as we said, packaging client uh, setup uh, procedures also vary because of that. So some packaging clients are easier to set up and some packaging clients are uh, much more difficult to set up and also require additional knowledge from these uh, mechanics. And the problem is that this number of mechanics is also limited. And another problem is that the, their skills vary because uh, some of them are more uh, suitable for, let's say, simpler product uh, packaging clients and some, some of them uh, must... Uh, uh, use all of their knowledge to set up packaging clients in situations where this uh, uh, setting up is really, really complex. So the consequences of these uh, challenges is that they, uh, the packaging center has a high complexity of scheduling process. Uh, and uh, because of that, uh, sometimes undesired uh, stopping of packaging clients occurs when there is uh, maybe a problem in uh, uh, assigning the right mechanics to uh, set up the lines. As we said, the number of these uh, mechanics is also limited. Uh, because of that, there is a lower capacity of utilization of their packaging clients as planned. And of course, sometimes even delivery dates can be comprom compromised. So we are in the middle of this project and I'm sure that we will be able to present final uh, results next year. But uh, some uh, activities have already been performed. So initial meetings with uh, plant managers, getting to know the uh, packaging center really, really well, uh, doing some uh, observations and some uh, initial screening of the whole processes. We also received uh, a lot of scheduling data for selected periods of time in the past that we could have a feeling what is going on really in production. And, and now we are in the middle of on-site interviews with different people from people who are in management of this uh, packaging center and mostly with uh, technicians, mechanics and operators because we want to uh, see their point of view, uh, what are the main uh, problems from their, uh, from their side in this scheduling, uh, scheduling problem. And uh, we are now also preparing the online survey that will be uh, that will basically cover all employed people at uh, this packaging center uh, who are technicians, mechanics, and operators. So what are our plant outputs? Uh, the initial idea was that we would like to prepare some kind of software tool that would help uh, with scheduling and personnel assignment in the, this uh, packaging center. 
but uh, it turns out that besides that, obviously some suggestions about new process and organizational model will also be necessary. So our uh, results that are due in few months uh, will probably cover both of these uh, uh, planned outputs. And like I said, I'm sure that we will be able to present that in future. That's from my side and my colleague, Professor Dorshak, will now present the other project from our university. Yes, okay. Hello, everybody from my side as well. In the um, next few minutes, I will give you a short uh, overview of the second part of this project that was dealing with uh, a specific design improvement on the device uh, for uh, dosing the pills on the packaging line. Uh, the packaging machine is a very complex uh, technical system, which is presented on this picture. And uh, the problem that we were dealing with uh, is on the very beginning of this line where the pills are coming into the, into the blisters. And then these blisters are packed uh, into the boxes. And uh, these boxes are then uh, somehow uh, um, further uh, taken uh, in consideration by other group, which uh, Professor Palcic was mentioned before. So uh, what was the problem? The problem is that sometimes the pills are jammed in the dosing device. This problem is not, um, according to my knowledge, very frequent, but it is frequent enough that, uh, that the company would like to solve. It. And uh, we, there are several possible scenarios what is happening. This process is very quick and the tablets, of course, are not alone in the channels, there are many tablets one after another. So it might be the problem that the tolerances of these channels are not uh, appropriate. It might be a problem that uh, the channel is too big and the tablet can somehow uh, go in the wrong position and stuck in, or even two tablets can make a, a gem. So there are different kinds of um, scenarios possible and what we made in the first part of the project is that we made a 3D model which is presented here and we just tried to um, go with the pad, uh, tablet with pills through these channels to see what is what is happening. Um, there are several possible um, solutions to these problems and uh, we uh, somehow selected three uh, solutions that would be more sensible more sensible first one is of course helping the tablets to go through the channels with compressed air this is the solution that was already checked within the company it is a problem that you um, need to regulate the pressure of the air very uh, precisely uh, if the pressure is too low then you doesn't this help is not uh, is useless if the uh, air pressure of the air is uh, too high, then it might happen that the tablet at the end of the channel jump out of the channel and doesn't end uh, don't don't end in and uh, doesn't end in in the uh, blister. Uh, so this is a problem we need to deal with. And uh, uh, the second possible solution would be to change the geometry of the feeding device channels, which is presented uh, on these two pictures. To make this more smooth, less uh, let's say smooth curve, in order to prevent any possible places where the pill could could really jam. And the third one is a cover at the exit from the feeding device, which is presented on the next picture. So you you have this feeding device channels, and you use uh, compressed air, but to prevent the pill at the very end at the exit from the channel to jump and not end into the blister, you, we would suggest the company to, to make this plate uh, so that the tablets would go under this plate in, into the blisters. Um, uh, afterwards, we made uh, original 3D models according to the uh, uh, manual measurements. I will explain a little bit later why manual measurements. Uh, but later on in the process of the, uh, this project, we made scan of the existing feeding device. These are scan um, 
pictures. And this is comparison between the scan model, which was made uh, according uh, after the scan and uh, after the manual man measurements. And it is obvious and, uh, that uh, small differences are present. So uh, of course, scanned model is more is more precise. And now what are the challenges we are still dealing with? Um, I would say first that observing, observing this problem was quite a complex. Why? Because uh, this gem is not very frequent. Uh, you can wait quite some time at the line to, to happen. Uh, being at the line is um, uh, conditioned with some, as you know, you need to be, everything needs to be uh, clean and so on. So uh, second uh, uh, point was that the manual measurements does not give adequate results, which we saw in the previous pictures, but uh, because this device needs to be cleaned before installed on the line, uh, it is very tricky. The company was not very happy to, to give us this part to scan because um, uh, they were afraid that they won't be able to clean it again. So this is why we used manual measurements to make 3D model. But later, as we, as we saw, uh, we did scan. And of course, scanning is conditioned by the coating application because otherwise we cannot scan this plastic material, which is semi-transparent. And now the question which arise is, uh, can this coating be appropriately removed? Appropriately means that the, the part will be clean enough again to be installed on the, on the line. And the answer is that uh, uh, we are uh, still in the process of testing how this piece could be uh, cleaned because we have now broken, the piece was broken, so it won't be installed in the line again. So we had a chance to try this to, to put this coating on, and now we will see if this coating can be removed completely. Uh, if we would later or in some other projects scan another piece, which would be need to install it again on the line. And that's more or less everything about this project, which is really a smaller part of the project which was presented by Professor Pachit. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, Professor Dolshak, uh, Professor Palcic, thank you very much for introducing production org organization excellence with us. Uh, since there are no questions in the chat um, and we have to be careful with time, um, I suggest that uh, we move on. So uh, last but not least, we will hear more about our great collaboration with University of Primorska, Faculty of uh, Mathematics, Natural Scientists and Information Technologies. The joint program will be presented by Professor Marco Oro, PhD, Professor Miklos Kris, PhD, and Vesna Stergar, PhD. Please. Um. <clears throat> Uh, thank you. Do you see the, uh, the slides? Yes, okay. Uh, thank you very much for attending this uh, presentation. Uh, so uh, I will present the, the, the project that it's, uh, we are, our faculty is having with no artists. Uh, before, before I start with the presentation, let me just mention that um, uh, our team at, at our faculty consists of Martin Milanić, Miklos Kresh, Alexander Tosic, and Michal Berchic, so mathematicians and computer scientists. And at the beginning of the, of the project, we had several meetings uh, with Novartis personnel where we needed to understand in full details uh, the problem that they gave us. So uh, a lot of communication was needed to understand all the details and several people were helpful. Some of them are listed here. I should emphasize that especially the communication with Pavel Vergano was extremely helpful to understand uh, the problem in full details. Um, so very basically the very brief description is, uh, is uh, what is the goal is to provide the software which plans the scheduling of the tasks in this uh, quality control sampling. Of course, all these tasks are related to many machines and to uh, people involved in this uh, sampling, in testing. 
Uh, now the current version, uh, the current version, uh, so prior to this project, the version of the scheduling was done by hand, basically. So using several uh, Excel tables, which were uh, uh, dependent to each other. So whenever some plan was done or maybe modified, somebody uh, from Novartis needed to, to manually modify all these tables together. So this has a lot of problems because it's time consuming. It's not uh, the scheduling is not necessarily optimal. And uh, also uh, just few people knows exactly how these tables are related to each, to each other because these tables are really huge. So our task is of course to, to provide a better solution and such a planner should have, uh, uh, of course, it involves, uh, there are many constraints for such a planner. So uh, the tasks are related with machines, machines are related to computers, uh, with uh, personnel and so on. And persons involved in all this testing are basically of two, two kinds. So one of them are analyzers, which basically test the samples and somebody are also approvers. And it's possible that a single person can be in the role of analyzer and approvers, but not together. And some person are qualified just to be analyzer, some person just to be approvers and so on. Also the samples that need to be tested are of different kinds. So some of them are called flexible tables, which means uh, flexible samples, which means that they have a large time window. On the other hand, there are also some samples which need to be tested in like the one day or two. So they are called non-flexible. Uh, so of course, all this scheduling should be should be optimal in the sense that uh, the the time should be reduced and also the cost should be reduced. And of course, you have bounds on on a, on a expected workload. So for example, it's not possible that a single person can work for one hundred hours in a row. So you have bounds of that of that type that you need also to 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 consider. Uh, and of course, some persons are, are capable, are qualified to do just some, uh, to work with just some machines. Some machines are capable to do just some tasks. So there are little, little uh, really a big number of combinations that need to be considered in, the, in this solution. So, so the, basically, the, uh, our working process was split in two parts, which also means that the team was split in two parts. Very roughly speaking, uh, 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 the first part deals mainly with computer science. The second part is mainly deals with mathematics, with applied mathematics. But of course, this mathematics should be also implemented into software. So there is computer science also there. So the first part consists of basically developing a software application, uh, which will basically replace all these Excel Excel tables. So it it will. Uh, all this input will be inserted into this into this system. And this system should be also able to integrate with external tools of automatic creation, which is basically studied in uh, in part two. So in part two, several algorithms were were, were basically or is being uh, basically invented, then developed and also implemented into software to to obtain this optimal optimal uh, scheduling. So the desire. Properties for this optimization model is, as I said, um, the merge, the merging of these tests should be optimal with respect to the time and, and costs. Uh, the planner should, of course, select people according to their basically uh, qualifications and availability, and also similarly with with machines. And uh, I said earlier that there are two kinds of samples to be tested: the flexible ones with the long uh, time uh, window should be done in one shift, so through one shift per day, whereas for non-flexible samples, which needs to be done in a day or two, we, we can afford like two shifts per day. Uh, results concerning the, 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 the development of the main software is basically, this is basically done. So the, the software already has the required uh, properties and it also programmed in such way that it provides this uh, application programming interface for the integration with the external software. Uh, so here, basically, what needs to be done is just to wait that this uh, uh, second part is developed till the end, and then the both of them will be combined to provide this uh, weekly scheduling of the tasks. 
uh, results on the, this uh, al development of algorithms. So here, of course, there were a lot of meetings just to understand the problems in full details, because if you don't know all the details, then you cannot start with doing algorithms. And then the strategy was to somehow develop this algorithm, so the, the, to divide the development into four parts. So one is related with optimal merging, one is to um, for the scheduling of the approvers, and then there also is the scheduling of analyzers who basically split it into parts for flexible and more flexible samples. So currently, the first three tests were already done. It means that the algorithms were invented, developed, and implemented in the software. The last part, which uh, considers the approver scheduling, still needs to be done. And after that, also some tests with real data should be should be uh, tested, and basically the two parts that I mentioned should be combined. So here you have also some sketch of some uh, some um, this optimization model how it works. It gives your input, then several algorithms are combined together, and the the output is of course the the weekly scheduling for this uh, uh, quality control sampling. So thank you for attending my talk. Okay, Marco, thank you. Um, once again, thank you for all the speakers. Uh, we are proud and honored that we can collaborate with such an amazing academic institution and make this great project. Uh, so uh, now is the time to take the second part of the event. Uh, the second part of the event will focus on sharing best practice on open innovation program. European Innovation Network and Novartis joined, for joined forces to identify, support and vali validate new solutions to improve healthcare delivery across Europe and beyond. Again, I invite the audi audience to ask their question in the chat and the speakers will answer them after the presentation. Now I invite Tal Vardi, Mayan Sharon and Julia Miller to tell us more about the program. Thank you, Tia. Uh, will you be showcasing the presentation? Yes. Yes, it's already in. Great, thank you. And you can thank hear you. me. Well? Okay. Um, so good afternoon, everybody, and thank you again for allowing us to present the best practice sharing of the Novartis uh, EIT collaboration on the Novartis Challenge It program. Um, and and I want to I want to provide a, a bit of context to how we we came to run this type of cooperation uh, a bit about you know the benefits around it and and my colleagues here will share more around what was the framework that was done how did we communicate that across across the cluster that we serve uh, so you will get a more of a feeling of what has been done and as mentioned this is still work in progress so this is still a project with, which is which is ongoing um can you please oh, okay uh, let me see. Can I change the slides myself? Or yes, you can share it. Uh, hi, and just support here. So just press the right button or left, so you can change the slide. Okay, thank you. Um, so, so I want to tell you of, of um, a bit of the rationale and and the organization that that I am heading. Um, I haven't introduced myself. My name is Talvardi. I lead the Central Eastern European uh, Biome for Novartis. Um, Biome is the Novartis innovation arm, and as you can see here on the slide, the person here on the right is Bast, who is the CEO of Novartis, um, uh, Global Novartis. And a couple of years ago, uh, when he was heading the Global Drug Development Department, um, he was looking into the way that Novartis is doing its clinical trials, and at the same time, we were looking at the customers that we serve, whether these are ATPs, whether these are patients, and, and we pretty much understood that these are no, the, the patients are no longer just a patient. The patient has become a consumer. And the ATPs are not ju just treating physicians, they are consumers as well. And therefore they go through a customer journey and customer experience is definitely one of the critical things that we as a company would like to care for. Um, so having said that, at the same time, we're looking at the external ecosystem. We see um, technology accelerating in a very, very fast way, impacting the way that uh, drugs are delivered and, of course, uh, discovered. 
At the same time, we look at digital health solutions, which are impacting the customer journeys. And we understand that as a company, it is, not, it is no longer just around research and development about discovering new medications. It, it's around providing the best medication, providing it in, in a relatively um, accessible and fast way. And it's about having the customer journey, um, the customer experience as, as part of that as well. And this is why we were, we were looking into beyond the pills, not only into medications, but beyond the pill solutions as well. But as you all know, Novartis is a research and development pharmaceutical company. We are not a technological expert. We don't have the tech expertise. And this is why the biome was created. So the biome is the innovation arm focused on digital health solutions, which really are coming to support and address problem statements which are coming from uh, the disease areas or the therapeutic areas that, that we, are, we are serving. Going forward. As you can see here on the slide, um, as I mentioned, uh, the biome is the innovation arm for Novartis. We're focused only on digital health, which means that you see here are areas of focus. Uh, we look at digital health from end to end. So we look at sensors, we look at uh, decision support systems, at applications, at algorithms. We're not into drug discovery and we're not into drug delivery. So we're, we're very, very much, very much focused. The aim, the aim for having the biome. So I talked about the rationale, of, uh, rationale for providing the biome. And there are three main, main objectives of having a, an organization like that within, within Novartis. One is, of course, as I mentioned, we are here to support the needs of the customers. We want to understand where are the pain points. We want to, we want to understand how can we improve the customer journey. And, and we want to do that by leveraging technologies and by leveraging the digital health solutions. So this is, of course, one. The second is all around driving affordable digital innovation solutions. So, and, and this is practically for, for Central Eastern Europe, which, which is the geography that, that, that I'm coming from. Many times when you want to use global solutions, global digital health solutions, the, the figures go up to five and six figures. This is, not, um, this is not affordable. This is not sustainable over time for small markets, for small, smaller markets like ours. Not to mention that the adaptation that is required due to regulation, due to language difference, in many times create a challenge for us to scale global solutions. Therefore, we want to come and look for solutions which are coming from our countries, which can be easily adopted from market to, from market, to market and easily scaled. But it's not only about scaling the solutions, it's around co-creating them with the stakeholders. So, we're not in a, in a place where, where Novartis today comes in and says, hey, we found a great solution for you. Please enjoy it. We are around co-partnering together with partners, whether it's um, uh, tech companies, whether it's hospitals, whether it's insurers, whether it's um, startups, academia. We are partnering in order to create and develop digital solutions together. And the third, of course, is, of course, for us, mainly as a company, we are going through the digital transformation as the whole environment. Uh, we are learning. We're, it, it's a learning process uh, and a learning journey for us as well. Uh, and this is part of our upskilling and our ability to adapt technologies into the company and upskill our people, of course, as well. So that was just to give you a bit of context about the biome. Uh, the biome is a global network. So uh, we have something like around 15 hubs all across the world. Uh, so you see in each of the bigger European markets, there is an innovation hub. Um, there is a global hub sitting in San Francisco and we are the Central Eastern European one, which is virtually located in Israel, but we serve around 30 markets, more than 30 markets across Central Eastern Europe. When, when, with the bigger ones being um, um, Hungary, Romania, um, Slovenia, Baltics, Israel, Greece, and Poland, of course. Uh, and the hubs are, of course, connected, and the interconnectivity of the hubs allows us to find the best partners to partner up to address our, our, our challenges, as well as find the right solutions that we really want to adopt and, and, and pilot, within, pilot within the company. Now, this was like pretty much the context to give you 
what we are, like what is the innovation arm for Novartis? We've launched it in Central Eastern Europe. And one of the biggest initiatives that we had for a launch was the partnership with EIT around the open innovation call. So the, the, the basics for, for this, let's say open innovation call was based on a collection of challenges that we have done all across the 30 markets. So we have collected the, the therapeutic area challenges that, that have been raised internally by our business teams. We clustered them, we tried to find commonalities, whether these are commonalities across specific therapeutic areas or commonalities which are like above them. So they are, they're common for beyond just, you know, specific disease areas. And we're, we were looking to see where we as a company want to focus. And you can see some of the, some of the challenges here as, as, as examples. And these were the base for our open innovation challenges. So when we see, when we talk about how do we create better access to care or how do we help patients navigate throughout their patient journey, we see that these challenges are coming all across different disease areas and different therapeutic areas. And this is why we chose to do an open innovation call, publishing these challenges, hoping to find solutions within the Central Eastern European cluster that we can potentially adopt and, and, and experiment. But in order to do that, as I mentioned, we are a cluster. So we, we serve more than 30 markets. It was, it, it, and generally when you serve more than 30 markets, you don't want to look just under the, the, the lamplight. So you want to look into solutions which are coming from all across the cluster. But how do you do it when you have 30 markets? And this was why we partnered up with, with EIT. We were looking for the right partner to do an open innovation call with. We needed a partner that has shared vision, that was looking into investing in startups and leveraging startups coming from our geography. We were looking for someone that has ge geographic presence across all the Central European markets. And we needed someone to help us drive the framework. So help us put, publish the call, um, uh, have the project run implemented, which included a lot of components, which, which Mayan will shortly share with you. But then again, we looked for a partner that will complement us in the value that they bring. So we as a company, as Novartis, can bring uh, benefits as in data. We can bring, can bring uh, benefits as insights, as knowledge, as access to our expertise. But then again, this is not enough when, when you look at the startups. You want someone that brings more than that. And this was one of the reasons, again, that we found EIT as, as a perfect partner for us to um, implement this, this, this program. And going forward, I will leave the stage of, um, to Mayan to tell you a bit more about how the project looks like, where, what we've done and where we're at at, at this point. Mayan? Yes, hi. Hi everyone. It's actually my second panel for today, so I feel at home. Uh, thank you, Tal. Um, we have the next slide, right? Or just one? Let's see. I see. You can, you can control it. Okay. You can control it with the button speed up. Okay. So, um, so as Tal mentioned, we uh, at EAT of Israel. By the way, we are the Israeli office of EAT as part of a global outreach project next to Silicon Valley Hub. We are the second hub that was established outside of Europe, and. Um, Basically, Julia will present in a second the PR and marketing phase, uh, but we created a structure program for the startup selected to this uh, uh, project in the hope to work, implement, or get an investment or to be open to other uh, investments and, and, and pilots with other companies and, of course, with Novartis. Uh, the structure of the program is uh, separated, is split to to actually a few elements. The first one, in Novartis, uh, there is the champion, the business owners who brought their knowledge and their expertise to support the selected startups uh, um, that are in this program. For example, if we have uh, predictive treatment uh, as a challenge and we have four, between three or four startups that are entering this uh, challenge, uh, there will be a Novartis expert that will support them along the way. So the startups are accepted and then get one-on-ones with uh, the startups uh, to understand their gaps and their needs. Afterwards, we have a pool of mentors 
course from Novartis, but from the Israeli ecosystem and from uh, EAT Health Innostar, so from the European ecosystem that are uh, diverse in their expertise. We're talking about uh, uh, leadership, legal, um, if they need uh, something about uh, um, um, business models or anything that can help them to accelerate and to um, answer their needs. So what, right now, as we are talking, we are now in the phase of connecting them to the mentors based on their needs. Uh, also, uh, we also structure a six meetings uh, um, sessions for the startups. We're talking about uh, um, access to um, to the patients when they building their solution. We're talking about cyber attacks, and the speakers are from Novartis. So we're bringing them another layer, another layer of, of getting to know Novartis and increasing increase their chances to work uh, with them at the end. Uh, finally. Um, after we have those mentors and, and answering their gaps, uh, we hope to celebrate together and to kick off the implementation phase, uh, hopefully to do it in person uh, in Europe. So um, this is how you see the structure, the, the circle of the supports in the startups. Um, I hope that's um, enough. Tal, you let me. Yeah, thank you. So. Of course. Moving on to Julia. Julia, will you, will you share your, will you manage the slides or do you want me to do it for you? Yes, I have it. Let me just go through these because oh. these were my slides. And just in a second, I can present you the communication strategy behind Challenge DIP. So we well know that partnerships often limit themselves to business strategy, funding, or KPI set in a contract. By creating an environment where the stakeholders want to get engaged instead of having to can become key to your success. My name is Julia Miller, and I'm a communication specialist at EIT Health InnoStars. And today here, I'm presenting you how we face this challenge in the communication campaign with Novartis. So through well-crafted communication strategy, we were able to build an authentic and compelling story that engaged key stakeholders in the region. Together with Novartis and the IT Hub Israel, we activated a network of ambassadors that helped us in scouting for the best startups and conveyed the challenge GIT call to action. Our goal was to harness the potential of the enormous audience that Novartis and the IT have together in Europe and beyond. So challenge GIT reached a multinational target audience over 5 million people through social media and traditional media. This is an estimated number that came together with six regional offices of Novartis in Central Eastern Europe and Israel, as well as 14 EIT Health Risk Hubs, together with the broad audience of EIT Health InnoStars and EIT Hub Israel. So what made Challenge EIT so engaging? Of course, the involvement of strong brands such as Novartis, Biome, EIT Hub Israel, and EIT Health InnoStars, and the fact that this was first kind of a project between Israel and the regional innovation scheme eligible countries, thanks to the Horizon Europe Research and Innovation EU Fund. Of course, it was important that this challenge is addressing contemporary major, major health challenges, but what helped our social media campaign to grow was the well-defined unique selling proposition and the narrative aimed at the pain points of startups in the region, such as cooperation with industry leaders and scaling up. And lastly, what made our campaign for Challenge GIT unique was the engagement of the leaders actively involved in the communication campaign. Here you can see an example of how using the real people behind the project helped us showcasing the credibility, the authenticity, and the freshness of Challenge EIT. This way we could engage everyone in the chain of Challenge EIT from mentors to project owners. Focusing on one call to action from various perspectives supported our campaign in remaining interesting for the whole process of the recruitment. Underpinning our social media results with traditional media has multiplied our applicants. We saw that from regions where traditional media campaigns were run, next to social media activities, we have a higher number of applications. In total, the news about Challenge EIT and traditional media reached an estimated 4 million of unique readers. So what are the tools that can help your stakeholders to navigate such campaign? We recommend creating a toolkit 
which is an informational and marketing material toolkit, which is easy to use and disseminate and ready to go. What helped us were the well-planned communication sprints with regular pulse checks on how our call to action is performing. Lastly, we created a hashtag, Challenge EIT, to see how our network of ambassadors engage. And through this hashtag, we can monitor how our campaign grows. So shifting from transaction to collaboration can move your partnership to another level. It can help to build an authentic environment that engages diverse stakeholders who will remain with you for longer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julia. Tia, back to you. Thank, yeah, thank you, Tal, Mayan, and Julia. Uh, so we have a few minutes uh, for questions, and we have one question. What are the benefits each of the partners, Novartis and EIT Health, uh, gets and brings to this type of program? So I can start and answer that, and then potentially Mayan will, will talk about the benefits of uh, EIT as well. Uh, but coming from Novartis, uh, when, when you come to a partnership like that, you bring, you, you bring multiple benefits. So as a global company, we have, of course, cross-functional people. So we have people coming from legal and compliance, uh, experts on GDPR, experts on business, experts on markets, experts on patients, everything. So one of the things that one of the things that we can we, we bring to the table is our expertise. So we bring our, our knowledge, our insights around, you know, the, the disease areas that we treat. We bring access to HCPs and key opinion leaders all across, you know, all across uh, the world for specific disease areas. And we can definitely create the access for startups that, that are that have entered into the program to both internal expertise as well as external expertise um, within the fields that we treat. This is one. Second, of course, is always around data. So we as a company, we have uh, um, a lot of data that we collect, whether it's coming from clinical trials, whether it's coming from real world evidence. So for startups, which are looking into uh, more around algorithms, we can provide anonymized data that will support them and complement them. So data lakes is definitely an, an additional um, an additional point and the third of course is access is access to our countries so as i mentioned before like if you do a pilot in one country and the pilot is successful you know according to specific apis it would be relatively very easy to scale it across the company so we create access we serve as as a gate to the Novartis world. So if you, you start with, you know, generally you start with a pilot within one country, then of, of course you scale. So this is what we bring, um, this is what our side, let's say, bring, brings to the table. And potentially the last thing is, of course, is the networking. So one of the things that I've already always heard of from startups is we want to understand your needs. We don't know who to contact. We don't know, know who to reach. So with, with that, you know, we are a gate to internal people within Novartis as well on all levels of the company, whether it's global, whether it's region, whether it's people located in the countries, but a network of people as well. Mayan, can you share about EIT? Yeah, of course. So uh, from our side, in general, is a strategic uh, uh, shift that EIT is doing is uh, moving and shifting to more of a results-oriented uh, projects and programs. So for us to work uh, with an organization like Novartis and startups that are mature and ready to implement and ready to pilot for us is a is a win-win situation because we can support and and uh, you know um, uh, um, see the success uh, while the program is running and that's uh, comparing to let's say a research program where we, they just have the idea. And we just, uh, you know, plant this uh, seeds of idea, and we'll see it in a few years. No, this uh, situation is a lot, a lot different. And uh, um, this is the one aspect. The second one is, as Dal mentioned, on the best practices and know-how. So we bring um, the experience of supporting startups. We have scalarators and accelerators, which we run for many years, and we have a lot of success stories. So. Uh, and also they can both enjoy the peer learning and we can connect between those communities. So all of these uh, um, are beneficial for us. 
Okay, once again, Tal, Mayan and Julia, thank you. And now time is time for a short break. Um, and then we will continue with the last part. So see you at uh, 10 minutes past two. Thank you.
So welcome back. I hope you could get some coffee and get ready for the last part. In the third part, we will hear more about the great project, which are the results of a joint PhD program between young researchers and Novartis in Slovenia. The same as in the first and the second part of the event, the speakers will have few minutes to answer on your questions, so please write them in the chat and we will try to answer them. Firstly, Daria Farceta Meliotto, PhD, will tell us why this program is so important. Daria, please. Thank you very much, Thea, for your introduction. Indeed, it is nice to have the opportunity to welcome you to the last part of this year's Researcher's Day, where we celebrate collaboration between industry and academia. It is here, in this shared innovation space, that many new solutions, concepts, and technologies are generated, fostering new competencies, knowledge, and talent development. I will briefly introduce one good practice case, which we have been developing and practicing together with the Faculty of Pharmacy, University of Ljubljana throughout last eight years. We call it Joint PhD Program in Biomedicine. And within this program, we invite top PhD candidates from Faculty of Pharmacy to work on research topics of shared business interest and expertise, mostly in our labs and as a part of our teams. With their research, they contribute to certain drug products or processes development, and thus they get firsthand experiences in industrial R&D. Each researcher has two mentoring teams, one at the faculty and one in the company. This way, the researchers get to know both organizations in terms of culture and ways of working. They are also great catalysts in connecting faculty and company mentoring teams. And more, they are great facilitators in exchange of knowledge and lessons learned. In addition, all PhD candidates are engaged in faculty lab practicums as teaching assistants, getting to know the curriculum closer, better, and might get an idea to propose some new relevant topics to be considered. After they finish PhD program, great majority gets employed by Novartis in Slovenia. Glad and proud to say, they really are top performers. So at the bottom line, all individual stories greatly contribute to highly reliable and sustainable partnership between the two institutions. Knowing each other well enough accelerates the speed with which any challenge can be approached. Working together also builds trust and flexibility in collaboration. Now, before I hand over to the PhD candidates, I should not forget to thank my faculty counterpart in developing and coordinating this project since the very beginning. This is Professor Borut Bajic, who unfortunately could not join us today, but is always ready to get uh, in touch with you and share his vast experiences with anyone interested. With this, I give the floor to uh, PhD students and wish you an inspiring day and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Daria, for your presentation and, of, co of course, for great co contribution to this program. I believe that without you and, of course, without Professor Borut Bajic, the program wouldn't live as strongly as it does now. So now is the time to go uh, to, to know ongoing projects. The third project will be presented by Blash Lieber, Robert Chink, PhD, and Professor Stane Pike, PhD. Hello. Um, just let me know if everything's all right. Okay, so to begin with, um, our PhD story has the title of 
study of interactions between excipients and monoclonal antibodies from uh, LEC, so from Gortis, we're working with uh, Roman Schink and Alex Zula. And from Faculty of Pharmacy, we're working with uh, Stan Pike and Yannis Mrolyak. Um, so in our PhD, we, we wanted to, to, to merge three parts. The first is Novartis, the second is Hydro Pharmacy, and the third is so the, the third site with, with who we are also working with is the NMR Center at the Institute of Chemistry in Ljubljana, where we're tightly working with uh, Professor Janis Plavets and Dr. Maria Tuplicek. Uh, we start, so what does a, a drug product uh, look like? Um, we need, um, we need cer certain combinations of excipients which offer chemical and physical stability. Um, among these excipients are uh, uh, buffering agents, antioxidants, surfactants, test stabilizers, and tonicity modifiers, which offer uh, sto sto stability. So we can stay away from de deamidation, uh, proteolysis, oxidation, aggregation, of absorption, and different temperature stressors, light stressors, and pH stressors. So we started our PhD with, um, with a test of pl plethora of monoclonal antibodies with dif different uh, buffer system. Um, so we tested se seven antibodies with 15 uh, bu buffers to determine how each of them affects the, the stability of monoclonal an an antibody by analysis of ag ag aggregates with size exclusion uh, from topography. Um, and the next thing, the most e e important thing is how do excipients stabilize these monoclonal, monoclonal antibodies. Our theory is that one of the way is by interactions. So if we, we wanted to um, to evaluate the, the, the method uh, which can um, which can we, with which we can observe the interactions of excipients with of proteins and this is the NMR spectroscopy. Um, the first sub method is 2D metal fingerprinting um which at with which we, we used uh, 30 c rather than 15 and uh, isotope and we could observe six out of the 20 amino acids on the protein and uh, ob ob observe the, the the effect that the excipients have on high order structure of the protein and the second sub method is one the nmr um uh, especially proton cpmj filter of water fluxy and STD, with which we only observe the ligand. And um, furthermore, we wanted to see if there's a difference between um, the results if we observe only the full monoclonal antibody or even the separate fragments of the antibody. Uh, and the last main aspect of our work was the instability of polysorbates in twisted in buffer and protective effect of some monoclonal antibodies. This is the continuation of the work of Emma Broch, a uh, previous candidate at my spot. So in, in a, a PhD thesis in combination with faculty and uh, lab, lab, laboratory formulations. And as you can see from the graph, uh, if we have a placebo formulations, meaning in, it, it only has uh, a histidine buffer and polysorbate 80, the polysorbate degrades. But if we had some pro proteins, uh, some will protect the po polysorbate from degrading and some will not. Why is that? Again, our hypothesis is that is the in it is the interaction between the antibody and uh, pol polysorbate. And to keep the presentation short, let's go to some of the important scientific highlights and keep an eye on the top right um, cor 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 corner, let me just use a pointer top right corner, uh, which will dis display with whom we, who, who we are wor working on the pre presented topic. Um, so the first thing we did was cleave the one of the four monoclonal antibodies to FAB and FC fra fragment. We did that with a specific enzyme called fe Fevalactica, and we used downstream process knowledge to separate it to clean and pure purified samples of pure FAD and pure FAT with uh, protein A, affinity liquid chromatography and size exclusion chromatography. Um, next thing, so the first obstacle we reached 
was the FC fragment in, in instability. So when we raised the pH of the uh, FC fragment, uh, it became um, opalescent and it formed re re reversible, reversible aggregate. Um, so there was an opportunity for, for, for us to, to find out what's happening using excipients. And we, we measured absorbance at 380 nanometers, which cor correlates with the aggregation. And we observed that some of the excipients, for example, uh, succinic acid, cit citric acid, uh, and ar arginine are better at stabilizing FC fragment at, at pH 6 than um, lysine or so sodium chlor chloride, for, for example. The effect of stabilizing is still uh, under evaluation. The next thing already mentioned is the 2D NMR performed at the Institute of Chem Chemistry at an NMR center. Uh, this is the FC fragment, um, or spe specifically the methyl fingerprint of the FC fragment, at which we can see that we can see the di differences between higher order structure of uh, fragment in bufferless for formulation than in histidine formulation. And these di differences are even more um, pr pronounced when we observe the FAB frag fragment. As you can see, the red denotes the bufferless formulation and blue, the histidine for formulation. This is the in in indirect method to uh, point to in 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 interactions. Uh, the next thing is evaluating interaction between polysorbate and monoclonal and, and antibody. Again, what we did, we took, uh, let's name it monoclonal antibody 2 uh, in histidine buffer. And when we added poly, poly, polysorbate 80, the polysorbate uh, degrade, for example, 60% in two months. When we used monoclonal antibody 1, the, the, this is the one which, we, which I uh, mentioned before, there was no polysorbate 80 deg degradation. So we uh, cleaved the uh, monoclonal antibody to FAB and FC. And what we expected, um, for example, what the, there would be a degradation of polysorbate 80 in one fragment, but not in, in the other, which would point that there's an interaction, interaction only with one subunit, but this is not the case. What we ob ob observe is that uh, there is PS degradation in both um, fragments. So what does it mean? Um, maybe it points to the interaction of the polysorbate 80 with the hinge re re region of monoclonal antibody, which the en enzyme cle cle cleaved. We wanted to support those findings by per performing molecular dynamic simulations uh, at the novel S SBS department in Novartis. And what we found out is that it also points in the same direction. With red, you can see the re regions which have a higher probability of having excipient uh, near the surface of the protein, uh, clo closer than 0 0.5 nanometers. And as you can see, the hinge region, hinge region is quite colorful. And last but not le least, it's the strengthening of the cooperation. Co 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 uh, we also worked with uh, a, a master student from Faculty of Pharmacy, um, Pia Kushir. Uh, she also did some supporting work, work to, to be a, a exact. She evaluated the effect of pH on the deg degradation of polysorbate in uh, histidine buffer. Her defense is planned in, uh, in a couple of months. Um, so to conclude, as we can see from our work, it's really important to involve knowledge from both industry and academia and use it in, in combination uh, with curiosity with, of young researchers. Uh, this will without a doubt help help both sides get, gain uh, new knowledge faster and more efficiently and also strengthen our uh, collaboration. Uh, th thank you for your attention. Uh, Lash, thank you for your presentation. Uh, since there are no questions, um, I suggest that we move on. So um, next will be the project from Ernest Sprager, Jozica Vashel, PhD, and Professor Tomasz Bratkovic, PhD. Or unfortunately, Ernest is on sick leave, so Jozica and Tomasz will uh, present the project. Yeah, hi. Uh, good afternoon. Hopefully you see the presentation. So as mentioned, unfortunately, uh, Ernest couldn't 
uh, can't be with us today, so I'll present our joint efforts to identify the host cell proteins in biopharmaceutical products on his uh, behalf. So, um, what are host cell proteins and why it is important to, to monitor them? Um, basically, they present the largest uh, or the main uh, group of process-related impurities in biopharmaceuticals and their final concentration. Concentration in the drug product needs to be tightly controlled for several reasons. Uh, for example, some of them are known to pose direct risk to drug recipient. They can either be immunogenic or they can be toxic uh, uh, because they, they possess inherent biological activity such as cytokines. Um, on the other hand, and this is the reason why we embarked in this project in the first place, is uh, some of them are known to uh, cause uh, protein drug degradations, uh, such as um, proteases and glycosidases, or um, alternatively, they can be associated with degradation of excipients, such as uh, polysorbate 80, um, in turn leading to, to protein drug instability. And here, some uh, 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 esterases or lipases can cause uh, major problems. So, as you can imagine, um, identifying the culprit in such a, such a, a case is not an easy task. Um, because there are hundreds or even thousands of possible host cell proteins that are uh, the, the, the possible culprits in, in, in every situation. So yeah, it is, um, it is important to, to understand the, the presence of the host cell proteins in the final drug product and drug substance. Um, most importantly, one should be able to to monitor the presence first of, of each and sp or, or specific problematic uh, HCPs in, in the final product. But this, of course, is not an easy task because there are no general or generic uh, analytical methods that would be sensitive enough to detect and quantify uh, each and every potential problematic HCPs. Um, there are methods as uh, ELISA or LC Tandem MS that are used for those purposes. But the problem uh, is worsened by the fact that certain uh, quite abundant uh, host cell proteins may mask the low abundant but more problematic HCPs. Um, yeah, uh, especially uh, uh, hydrolases, so the enzymes can cause problems even though they're present in, in minute amounts. Um, and the other thing that one would like to know is to, to understand the underlying mechanism behind the purification of uh, each individual HCP. So um, does the specific HCP interact with the, um, with the uh, stationary phase of the uh, chromatographic column? or does it form interactions or complexes with the protein drug and essentially uh, piggyback rides uh, over the um, course of, of sequential uh, um, chromatographic purification steps. And um, we have approached the problem of identifying the uh, HCP that causes a polysorbate 80 degradation in um, monoclonal antibody formulation using the activity-based protein profiling. This is um, basically means, uh, this basically means using a uh, covalent probe. So a ligand of, uh, let's say, serine hydrolases uh, that upon binding to this class of enzymes forms a stronger covalent bond, bond with the enzyme. And then on the uh, distal part of this probe, there's an affinity tag um, that can be used to uh, fish out or so to say to pull down the, um, the, the, the um, hydrolases in this case, uh, essentially enriching them so they can be easily identified with the LCMSMS technique. And in addition to um, commercial probes. Uh, we have recently started a collaboration with 
a group of researchers from uh, the Department of Pharmaceutical um, Chemistry at our faculty um, in, in designing and synthesizing new activity-based uh, probes. And we're quite excited about the, the ongoing process um, uh, of this project. Um, this is an example of an experiment that Ernest uh, conducted. So basically when he, uh, when he um, tried and, and uh, detect the HCPs present without the previous enrichment, he noted that there are more than 400 different HCPs, but only a few of them can be potentially associated with uh, polysorbate degradation. On the other hand, when he used the uh, prior enrichment, he identified uh, just below 300 HCPs. Um, you can see that there's not much of an overlap between the two samples. However, the, the list of potential culprits for, for the um, polysorbate 80 degradation is much larger. And um, these hits are like are the likely more likely culprits and um, this this such an identific identification of hits allows for a focused tracking of individual hcp during purification so uh, along the the uh, sequential chromatographic or other uh, purification steps but um, then again these are only hits right so um, we would very much like to identify or not just identify but validate or better yet qualify those hits uh, to, to verify whether they are really capable of, of degrading the polysorbate 80 and one of the experiments that are typically done is uh, we can use a recombinant version of this uh, uh, lipase in this case this was the top hit uh, and spike it in the final drug product and then monitor the kinetics of enzymatic uh, polysorbate degradation by uh, an HPLC method. And indeed, uh, you can see that the uh, rate of degradation is uh, dependent on the, uh, on the concentration of the spiked in uh, lipase. Um, then, Another indirect uh, proof that this uh, specific lipase is uh, the, the likely culprit uh, catalyzing uh, the, the degradation of uh, polysorbate 80 is the fact that if you add a specific inhibitor of this enzyme, you can basically prevent the uh, polysorbate degradation. And currently, Ernest is uh, very much focusing on uh, elucidating what the uh, mechanism of uh, this lipase copurification is. Uh, for that, he turned to molecular modeling and he noted that the uh, um, surface of this lipase is very much complementary to the surface uh, of the FAB region of this specific uh, monoclonal antibody product, both uh, in, in terms of uh, steric and electrostatic complementarity. And indeed, uh, using uh, biolayer interferometry, so a typical uh, wet lab experiment, Ernest was able to show that uh, indeed, the, the, this interaction is limited to the FAB region. So there's uh, absolutely no interaction with the FC region of this lipase. But when you uh, use the, the entire monoclonal antibody, you can nicely see the, the interaction. Um, so this is the, the, the project, uh, basically, in a nutshell. Uh, as uh, mentioned before, this is a joint PhD program between Novartis and the Faculty of Pharmacy, University of Ljubljana, that I find uh, yeah, very rewarding. I think that both sides will, will agree. So uh, we in the academia uh, get a glimpse of, of, of uh, the, the techniques and the problems that the uh, 
that the industry has. On the other hand, um, I think that uh, people in Novartis um, uh, uh, maybe maybe get some uh, uh, fresh view from the outside. Uh, but most importantly, um, the the PhD students have a chance to develop their talents. Um, the, the, the work, as I've said, is very rewarding because you work in, in providing solutions to um, some actual problems, so very applicatively uh, orientated. And of course, the students have the um, possibility to publish uh, scientific papers, and this is a skill that uh, that is, uh, um, of course, um, uh, uh, well uh, uh, wanted, right, in, 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 a, in a young scientist. So um, thank you for your attention. Professor Bratkovic. Yep. Uh, thank you and thank you for stepping in on Ernest's behalf. Yeah. So uh, the last project will be presented by Katja Glinshek, Ruk Gaber PhD and Professor Boruc Trukel PhD. The world is yours. Uh, thanks, Taya. Just a second. So yeah, hi everyone from my side. I'm Katya and today I will present my PhD project in the field of glycoengineering of production cell lines. As previous projects um, that were presented, um, this is another example of great collaboration between academia and industry, where me and Professor Borut Strukel represent uh, participants from the academia, from the Faculty of Pharmacy, and uh, together with a number of colleagues coming from Novartis. So I would like to start this presentation with a very simplified uh, introduction into biosimilar development. Um, just a second. Um, so the goal of biosimilar development is uh, to develop a highly similar copy of uh, reference biologic that is already on the market. And we usually start with a detailed analytical characterization of this biologic, where we want to determine uh, uh, protein attributes that are critical for the product quality and function such as amino acid sequence, glycosylation profile, and many others. And all these attributes that needs to be closely monitored and controlled from the generation of production cell line through the bioprocess optimization to the final purification steps at downstream department to, at the end, uh, get a biosimilar drug substance with all these uh, critical quality attributes in the range of reference biologic. As it's obvious from the title of my presentation, I will talk a lot about glycosylation and why is glycosylation so important to us? Um, the majority of therapeutic proteins are post-translationally modified by sugar chains called glycans. And these glycans then directly influence the stability, the potency, plasma half-life, immunogenicity, and effector functions of therapeutic proteins. Another thing, important thing to mention is um, that glycosylation is not template-driven process. And a lot of different factors influence the structures of uh, these glycans. And, um, it is recognized as one of the most uh, challenging aspects in uh, proving biosimilarity. And how are we dealing with glycosylation in cell line development? So cell line development starts with an introduction of DNA coding for the therapeutic protein into the host cell line. So in our case, these host cell lines are CHO cell lines. And ideally, 
we get uh, all cells uh, producing large amount of the therapeutic protein with a glyco pattern that is already closed or uh, in the target range of the originator. But in reality, we are actually dealing with a population of cells uh, in which every single cell produces different amount of therapeutic protein with a slightly different glyco pattern. And um, we need to generate thousands of clones and screen for the cell that produces uh, the uh, protein with the, the right glyco, uh, glyco profile. And some, I mean, usually it is it, this extensive clone screening is actually not enough to find such cell. And um, extensive upstream and downstream development is then needed to actually get sufficient amount of therapeutic protein with the glyco uh, profile on target. And very often we need to sacrifice the productivity in order to, to match this uh, um, glyco profile. And here actually comes the, our idea. So we were th thinking, why don't we take a high producing cell right at, at the beginning of our development and then engineer it in a way that will start um, producing the, the right glyco pattern. And during this project, we tested different kinds of technologies uh, for modulation of gene expression. So our target genes were, of course, genes that are involved in uh, glycosylation pathway. And we tested different, um, so to say, state-of-the-art technologies. So CRISPR-Cas technology to, to, to activate the expression of target genes, CRISPR for downregulation of target genes. And we also compare uh, these state-of-the-art technologies with more uh, classical uh, approaches such as gene overexpression and shRNA technology. And I'm um, already at the first example. So in this first case, the model protein is biosimilar FC fusion protein with a two distinct uh, protein domains. The, the, one, the first one is target binding domain and the second one is FC binding domain with a multiple N glycosylation sites on, on both domains. And in, in this case, we were testing CRISPR-I technology. So uh, technology for down regulation of, of, of target gene. And in, 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 in our case, this was a food aid gene that is involved in focusylation. And um, we generated uh, cell lines that were um, uh, stably expressing both this CRISPR-I system together with a model uh, protein. And um, after the enrichment step, where we enrich cells um, with the desired glyco profile, so in our case, low uh, focusylation, uh, we actually ended up with uh, cells that were producing a, uh, this, um, um, proteins with a desired glyco profile. So they had lower focusylation on both domains, on target binding domain and FC domain. And um, uh, with this, we actually showed that um, such tools could be used to accelerate biosimilar development. Even more, we also show that uh, these kind of tools can be, can be used for fine tuning of uh, focusylation level on therapeutic proteins and can be applied to different biosimilar project that differs in, in a, um, yeah, uh, focusylation tar target level. <clears throat> um, my last example is a classical monoclonal antibody. Um, so here, what you can see is the target range in, in this case of target range of reference biologic in, in our focusylation. And here on, on this side, you can see the level of afocosylation that was achieved with cell line development. But it's very obvious um, that we are 
quite far from the target range. And here I would like to point out that with a further upstream um, development, we actually achieved the target range. Uh, it's not shown on, 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 on this chart. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, we needed to, to sacrifice a lot of um, tighter in order to, to reach the, the target range. And um, so, yeah, our group then um, was thinking how can we use, how can we uh, glycoengineer this uh, clone A? And we overexpressed uh, three genes. Uh, that are involved in focusylation pathway. And we actually ended up in the range of the originator without any productivity loss. So this is it from my side and um, I'm ready to answer your questions if there are any. Thank you, Katya. Uh, yes, we have one question actually, and it's for all uh, three PhD candidates um, or two candidates and uh, Professor Bratkovic. Uh, so in academia industry collaboration, we may experience some friction in limited new discoveries publication possibilities. Do you maybe have an advice or good experience to share? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so maybe I can start. <laughs> Um, yeah, I would advise all new PhD candidates to actually start with um, conversation uh, together with uh, patent attorneys right at the beginning of their project, um, just to avoid any um, yeah, possible uh, challenges that might come later in the project. Um, because in, in the beginning, you can still adjust maybe the topic or you can already align what is pu publishable and what is not. So, yeah, that, that would be my advice. Yeah, I agree. That's probably the, the, the best advice that one can give. <laughs> Great. Uh, do we have maybe also Blash um, still with us? Um, um, yeah, sure. Um, okay. I agree with the answer. There, there has to be a lot of uh, healthy uh, communication with the uh, patent attorneys and um, um, people who know which uh, information can be delicate, and there is always a solution we can find. Okay, great. Thank you, Blash, Katya, um, and Professor Bratkovic. And uh, I wish you a lot of su success on your PhD journey. Uh, and now I invite Matea Kramer, PhD, and Joanna Delgado to tell us more about Novartis Digital Brain. Hello, can you see me? All good, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, hello also from my side. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the UniMinds organizing committee and also Dr. Daria Ferceta Meliotto from Novartis for organizing this wonderful event uh, that really brings together all those innovative minds, so from students to industry, so which is really great to see. Uh, and also at Novartis, we acknowledge the importance of such external engagement and outreach, so you saw really all these three projects, uh, collaboration with academia, industry, and great progress that we do. And uh, that is why also the TRD academic network, so in Novartis, we established because all of these um, collaborations, uh, so um, a few years ago, such network was established uh, to lead the implementation of mid to long term innovation strategy and actively engage in driving the long-term strategic partnerships. So meaning that many uh, new initiatives, many trends, many projects, so, and building capabilities we really do uh, together with academia. And for this purpose, uh, one of our major objectives from the TRD Academic Network is really to map and track collaborations with academia, both active uh, collaborations and recent, to facilitate the initiation and execution of collaboration within the Novartis framework. So to really ease the burden, to help with uh, the question as it was now IP, 
uh, and to be fast with the processes of contracting and delivering on the projects and also to maximize in that way the collaboration efficiency and output via proper tracking of progresses. Uh, and that is how just one year ago we came across the digital brain tool. Uh, and Joanna, uh, she's uh, on a call today also with me and she will introduce the tool to you. And let me introduce Joanna. So she is a Portuguese living in the Czech Republic with a PhD in conservation science. Her background is in research and innovation, and she has over seven years of experience in the tech industry and software solutions strategy and development. Currently, she's working as a senior product manager for the Global Novartis Bion team, continuing to support innovation through the collaboration with the best in our partner ecosystem. And with that, I hand over to Joanna to introduce the digital brain tool. Okay, thank you so much. Hi, everyone. So um, as Matteo was mentioning, I'm here today to introduce uh, the Novartis Digital Brain. Uh, let me just start sh sharing my screen. And the and the Novartis Digital Brain is essentially a tool that uh, we have created to facilitate the, um, the partnerships, not only for Novartis Associates and for us internally, but also for, uh, for people externally. And um, just uh, as an introduction on what the Novartis Digital Brain is, so it is an innovation management platform, and this is open to all Novartis Associates across all regions and uh, divisions, and uh, main objective is to democratize the access to information on data, digital, and technology-focused partnerships across Novartis. So this is about providing the access to our current and future health tech ecosystem partners, as Matteo was already mentioning. And uh, the main goal is also to help uh, the Novartis teams to co-create and collaborate on common challenges together with these partners. Um, and uh, also what I would like to explain, like what is the benefit uh, to you? So why would um, an external uh, a company want to be registered and to use this tool? So uh, first is to, to get noticed. So anyone can really register and manage their company profile. So this is about owning uh, your company. And this can be from any from startups to established companies and also um, uh, academia. And uh, it's to own the, the page so that it becomes um, a part of Novartis Celtic uh, partners ecosystem. And in this way, you can control the information and really showcase uh, the offerings, the projects you're working on and all the capabilities across this uh, wide audience at Novartis. And ultimately the goal is to create impact. So you will have access to Novartis Open Innovation Challenges. So this will allow you to uh, submit directly your proposal through the digital brain. So um, this just to explain, so Novartis uh, teams from different regions and divisions, they're publishing their open calls for submissions if they have any challenge. And external audiences can submit their proposals uh, to have a chance to collaborate with Novartis and ultimately scale their solutions globally. Um, and this is what the, the platform looks like. So you just go to, and uh, I can share later, but you just go to digitalbrain.novartis.com and uh, you can register as, um, as a partner. Then we will verify your, your profile and you have access. And once you have access to the platform, so this is what you're going to see, uh, you have your own company uh, profile there. And uh, you also have the list of all the open challenges that are available for you to submit your proposals. And then on your profile, you can edit everything and uh, also submit the proposals. But in editing, you can um, add more information about your projects, about what, the, um, what you do. Uh, also invite your colleagues and uh, add more, um, more contacts to, um, to here so that they can also collaborate uh, together with you in uh, building this profile. And you can also upload documents. So any uh, publications or reports or anything that you might have, a pitch deck, you can also upload here to help also Novartis teams to better understand what, um, what you are doing and to, to foster this collaboration. 
Uh, as for the process overview, very quickly, so you just register in the digital brain, uh, then our team will be reviewing and verifying your registration. And once uh, this is done, you will have access to the platform so that you can start uh, showcasing your company's offerings and capabilities, and then stay in touch with us and uh, start submitting uh, your proposals to any open challenges. So this is very briefly what the digital brain is. And uh, now I would just like to see if there are any questions. Yeah, uh, if I may just add, so uh, really this uh, um, tool, so everyone can register, even though we don't have any collaboration, you know, is uh, you can register and then when uh, Novartis Associates looks for some capabilities or some tools, uh, they can search through digital brain. And this is really now very, um, I would say, hot tool for Novartis Associates. And we can find you then also through this. Important is that you register and then Joanna and her team really validates your registration. And um, yeah, so we have active and not active. So for everyone, is this applicable? Uh -huh. So Daria is asking how many external partners have already entered in the digital brain. So we currently have uh, over uh, about uh, 2,500 companies listed there from, again, startups, venture funds, academia. And uh, of those, uh, there is uh, about 15% of them are current or past partners of Novartis. And the others are essentially in the, in the pipeline. So as Matea mentioned, not all of them are current partners or we have an active collaboration with them, but uh, they are always there uh, for um, like, uh, so every time a Novartis associate is looking for, for a company to work with, uh, they're, they're going into the digital brain to do this research as a starting point. Great, thank you, Matea and uh, Joanna uh, you so for your presentation. So um, we have come to the end of our program. I hope that you enjoyed it and found out how we co-create an innovation-driven environment. If you have any questions, you are welcome to contact our speakers via Jubilo Portal and they will be happy to answer you. I wish you a pleasant next two days at the Unimines Festival. As for the Novartis Researchers Day, see you again next year. So thank you and goodbye. Thank you, goodbye.